step with me into a time machine. Let's define that as a contraption that can transport you to any event in space-time, which in this case is 45 years ago, in a quaint and quiet Swedish small town. The day is October the 10th, 1975, and on this autumn Friday, a young doctor, fresh out of medical school, is on shift in the accidents and emergencies ward in the hospital of a small Swedish coastal town of about 35,000 people. It's been a very calm morning, and it's now lunchtime, and most of the senior personnel, the doctors and nurses, are down in the hospital cafeteria for lunch. And everything looks and feels very routine. Until, suddenly, the phone rings. The hospital is being advised by emergency responders that a plane crash has occurred in the vicinity and that the arrival of the first casualties by helicopter is imminent. Now as soon as the young doctor hangs up, he grabs a nurse and they race over to the shelf with a binders containing the emergency procedures because they now have to immediately prepare the area for a mass casualty contingency, which means set up triage procedures, remove all non-essential vehicles from the car park, activate personnel that's on call, etc, etc. Their frantic preparation is cut short when they hear the chopper land on the hospital ceiling pad and seconds later the first patient is wheeled through the doors on a stretcher. And the doctor immediately starts evaluating the patient. He's conscious and he's breathing, but otherwise he's not in great shape. He's shaking violently, he's incoherent, and when the doctor dresses him he can't verbally respond because all that the patient utters is a sound like now, the doctor immediately recognizes this as symptoms consistent with cerebral trauma. The patient evidently has had a head injury, and he could lose consciousness any moment. And as he's examining this patient, the doctor is removing the patient's life jacket. It was a plane crash into water. Drops that on the floor, and what he sees now is a military flight suit that the patient is wearing. So evidently, he's dealing with a fighter or a bomber pilot. And suddenly, the penny drops for the doctor that the zzzz sound that the pilot was making could have been an attempt to speak Russian. Now, the doctor speaks a little Russian from classes that he took at university, so to reassure the patient that he'll be all right, he says, I'm a doctor, you're in a Swedish hospital. And at this, the pilot's eyes get as big as dinner plates. They just widen in horror. He's, he's still not verbally responding, but to the doctor, the picture is very clear. This is a Soviet pilot. Again, this is the mid-70s. And that pilot is understandably terrified that he's been shot down over hostile territory. And the doctor comes to a dismal conclusion, which is if we're shooting down Soviet jets, then we're probably at war with the Soviet Union. And that in turn means that we're probably in the opening minutes of World War III, 1975, height of the Cold War. But as he momentarily looks down, he realizes that he has a much more urgent problem on his hands with this particular patient because he, the doctor, is standing in a red puddle that has formed on the floor. So this patient evidently doesn't just suffer from cerebral trauma, but he also has an open wound, possibly an arterial bleeding, and they haven't found that yet. So they need to get his flight suit off of him as soon as possible. But unfortunately, the doctor isn't very accustomed to patients wearing military flight suits, so he's running into a snag. He simply can't find the right zippers or buckles to get the suit off the pilot. Whatever he tries, all that he manages to do is open one of the many pockets that the suit has. So he grabs a pair of scissors to cut the suit open. And at this stage, it's something like 90 seconds after the original call, and the senior doctors and nurses are finally pouring in from wherever they had spent their lunch break. And just as he's about to cut into the trousers of the flight suit, a nurse stops him and says, don't do that. That's a G-suit. Those are thousands of kroner apiece. That's 1975 kroner, so you'll have to multiply by about 5.7 to account for inflation to the present day. But at this comment, the doctor looks at her, obviously momentarily befuddled, and in the pause, she adds, oh, and you may want to step off his rescue jacket because it looks like you popped the sea dye marker pouch and you're making a mess all over the floor. After which he expertly strips the patient of his flight suit and the evaluation of this patient continues, a patient who, it turns out, is a Swedish Air Force pilot who was forced to eject from his Saab AJ-37 vegan strike fighter, tail number 37005, in which he had been on a routine training flight over the Baltic Sea. He then lost control of his plane due to a structural failure, a wing fracture, a problem that was common and plagued the airframe in the mid-1970s, and who was subsequently pulled out of the 8 degrees Celsius water by a search and rescue team which then flew him promptly to the nearest hospital because he was suffering from a rather bad case of hypothermia, the symptoms of which, of course, include incoherence and slurred speech and violent shivers. And the reason I'm telling you all this is that absolutely every single assumption that the doctor had made was wrong. With one exception, there was actually a plane crash. But it involved a single-seat military aircraft rather than a commercial airliner. Therefore, mass casualty treatment was never required. They were all dealing with a single-accident survivor all along. 
The patient wasn't suffering from cerebral trauma, but from hypothermia. The patient also was not trying to speak Russian. He simply couldn't get any words out, again due to his hypothermia. And the patient also was not suffering from sudden catastrophic bleeding. Instead, the red puddle came from a fluorescent C dye marker cartridge. Those interestingly are supposed to look green when they're dissolved, but they're bright red when they're concentrated. And of course, Sweden was not at war with the Soviet Union and nuclear Armageddon wasn't imminent. And thankfully for the doctor, none of the decisions that he made based on his wildly inaccurate assumptions actually harmed anyone. Other than, of course, scaring the living daylights out of Swedish Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Harald Gartel, who, after what must have already been the worst day of his flying career, came to just to find out that rather than being pulled from the Baltic Sea by Swedish Navy comrades, he'd been presumably abducted by a team of Spetsnaz and spirited away to somewhere where the doctors only spoke Russian. And he, that is, the doctor, reflected later in life that he was actually quite thankful for this inconsequential mishap early in his career as it profoundly and permanently influenced his later thinking, which was to always challenge your own assumptions. And the young doctor, incidentally, became a very famous man. Following this approach, in the early 1980s, he discovered a working prevention mechanism for Konzo, or bound legs disease, while on a Doctors Without Borders mission in Central Africa. He became the professor of international health at the prestigious Karolinska Institute in 1995, and in the early 2000s, he rose to internet fame with his data visualizations and riveting commentary about public health issues. I'm, of course, talking about Hans Rusling, who left us much too soon in 2017. What we can do is take Hans's advice, and we can apply it to operating and running OpenStack. Let's always challenge our own assumptions. And that's really what this talk is about, becoming a better OpenStack user or operator by not always relying on your first impression. Now, OpenStack's complexity undoubtedly comes with operational challenges, and in situations where OpenStack misbehaves, it's frequently non-trivial to find the actual cause of an issue. In this talk, include several examples of red herrings in OpenStack and suggestions for spotting and avoiding them. What's a red herring? For those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with the idiom, I'm not talking about actual red herrings. A red herring is something that misleads or distracts from a relevant or important question, according to Wikipedia at least. In other words, among other things, a red herring is the apparently obvious cause of a problem, whereas the real cause is non-obvious and frequently completely different. Let's start out with something relatively straightforward, virtual routers in Neutron. What I'm doing here is I'm simply creating virtual routers in a loop. I'm operating against a single tenant, and I just add one virtual router after another. And that seems to all work just dandy until suddenly it doesn't. So let's see what's at fault here. Let's start with the obvious assumption. I'm running into an administrator in post limit. So providers can set these limits through the OpenStack quota system. So let's check whether perhaps I'm running into a quota limit. Luckily, I can always check what my quota is. So if I look for my router quota, in this case, I see that I can create a whopping 500 of them. And the same thing is true for our subnets. And the same thing is also true for our networks. Those might also be issues. And I can also see that I have enough ports so evidently, I'm not running into a quota issue. Uh, besides, if I actually exceeded a quota, what I ought to get back here from Neutron is an HTTP 413 error rather than the HTTP 200 combined with the router error status that we're actually seeing. So we can dig a little bit further. Maybe Neutron has a configuration limit on the maximum number of routes per tenants, just like heat has for stacks. That does exist, it's called quota router, but what it says is just the default quota for routers, and it does get overwritten by quote explicitly set on a tenant. So unfortunately, the router avenue doesn't get us anywhere. So let's try one thing by way of experimentation. Let's try and create a router that has HA disabled. So we're creating a router explicitly with the no HA flag, and then finally that works and it works immediately. So without HA it works, with HA it doesn't. What about HA routers and how do those work? Well, way back in the OpenStack Juno release, we got high availability support for, for Neutron routers, uh, which means that assuming you have more than one network gateway node and that can host them, your virtual routers will work in an automated active backup configuration. So in effect, what Neutron does for you is that for every subnet that's plugged into the router and for which it therefore acts as the default gateway, the gateway address binds to a keepalive debacked VRP interface. 
and on one of the network nodes that you have, your that interface is active, and on the other one it's in standby. And if your network node goes down, Keep Alive D makes sure that the subnet's default gateway IPs come up on the other node. And that Keep Alive D configuration is completely ab abstracted away from the user. The Neutron uh, agents happily take care of all of that. But in order to enable HA routers, Neutron creates one administrative network per tenant over or project over which it runs VRP traffic. And in order to tell apart all the Keep Alive D instances that it manages on the network, it, it's, it assigns each of those an individual virtual router ID or VRID or sometimes also pronounced VRID. And here's the problem. RFC 5798, the thing that defines this protocol, VRP, defines the virtual router ID to be an 8-bit integer. And that means that if you use HA routers, then setting a router quota over 255 is useless because Neutron will run out of VRIDs in the administrative network before your tenant can ever hit the quota. And this is a hard limit. There's really not much that Neutron can do about this apart from changing its approach or changing the RFC, which probably won't work. So therefore, at least for the time being, if you want more than 255 highly available virtual routers, you'll have to spread them across multiple tenants. You might say you really don't need HA routers. Well, first of all, you probably do want them really, but let's assume for a moment that you actually don't, or rather it's more important for you that you have more than 255 routers in a single tenant when, than for any of them to be highly available. So you're guessing you can create routers with the HA flag, flag set to false. Uh, but it turns out you probably won't be able to do that, and that's not because you can't change the router's HA flag with, without first temporarily disabling it. That's fine. That's not going to hurt you much. But uh, it's because the default Neutron policy restricts setting the HA flag on a router to admins only. So if you want to be able to disable a router HA capability from a user API call, you'll first need to override um, some default entries in depending on OpenStack version, Neutron's policy, JSON policy, YAML, or whichever. Um, and what you want to set is uh, you want to override these rules, the create router HA, get router HA, update router HA, from admin only to admin or owner. And of course, if your cloud service provider deploys Neutron with OpenStack Ansible, or you are that service provider, then you can define this in a variable from OpenStack Ansible. And once the policy has been overridden in this manner, then you should totally be able to create a new router with this command, OpenStack router create, dash dash no HA. And you can also modify an existing router's high availability flag with OpenStack router set. You first have to disable the route temporarily, then you toggle the HA flag, and um, then you re-enable it. Here's another red herring uh, that's interesting, and it comes from Magnum. What are your prerequisites in Magnum to run a Kubernetes cluster? Well, there's three, really. You need to have a glance image for one of the operating system platforms that Kubernetes supports. Um, there are several, but uh, Fedora CoreOS is the best tested and most widely used. And before the Fedora CoreOS uh, transition happened, it used to be Fedora Atomic. Secondly, you need a Magnum cluster template that references that image. And then finally, you need to use that template to actually spin up your Kubernetes cluster. So let's look at this. Um, so here's my image. Um, it's a little dated at this point. You shouldn't be using Fedora Atomic 27 anymore, but the same consideration essentially applies to the current Fedora CoreOS 32. Um, but that image should be totally supported uh, for deploying the Kubernetes release that I've selected here uh, with Magnum. And I have a cluster template. Uh, it sets the cluster orchestration engine to Kubernetes, uh, and it also sets the kube tag label, etc. Um, and my cluster is spinning up exactly as expected. But I then decide, well, I really want to use a different image. And again, in this example that I'm using here, it's slightly dated at this point. Uh, it talks about Fedora Atomic Host 29. You shouldn't be using that anymore, but it still serves to illustrate the concept. Now I do that. I've uploaded a Fedora. Uh, Atomic 29 image, and again, in principle, deploying Kubernetes off of this uh, should work. Uh, but it's a little bit weird. Everything I set up is um, exactly as I should, as it should be. But what I'm still getting is this HTTP 400 error, which is uh, you know this rather nondescript bad request error. 
And when you see this, um, you probably think that something's wrong with your API call. It's a bad request. And since I've been making all my API calls essentially by the book, the first problem to assume would be a bug in the Magnum client library or the OpenStack client or in both. Well, wrong again. It's just another red herring. It turns out that the culprit is actually missing property on the image, OS distro, which must be set to the proper value for the matching driver. So in this, as I said, slightly dated example I used, Kate's Fedora Atomic V1, and there it had to be set to Fedora Atomic. These things have now slightly changed for Fedora Core S, but it's essentially the same thing. This is actually very well documented. You can totally find this in the Magnum documentation, but many Magnum users never really need to use a private image, and when they do, and they naively create this, the missing property and the rather unhelpful error message sometimes trips them up. But once we set this variable, then we're ready to create our cluster template. Once we've got the template, we can fire up a new cluster and then we can use Kubernetes from there. My third red herring for you has to do with heat templates. Now, this is also an interesting one. What I'm doing here is fire up a heat template and I get a nondescript HTTP 500. Now, adding dash dash debug to this command will clarify that we're dealing with a server-side encoding error. It actually complains about the fact that something in there can't be decoded as proper UTF-8. So in other words, it's the heat API endpoint, not the client, which is weird, that's complaining that it's been given a template with an invalid encoding, which sounds buggy, because if it actually was an incorrectly encoded template, then the heat client should have caught that. And the additional information that I got here in this case was pretty useless because I was actually, I saw an exact character that Heat was complaining about, but then that one was definitely not incorrectly encoded. I could verify that the encoding was correct. It was in, in fact a US ASCII character. So there really can't be any encoding issue when it comes to Unicode. So the funny part about this one is when I ran into this bit, I ran into it without making any cha uh, changes to my template uh, whatsoever. It had previously worked quite all right. And the only thing that had changed when I first saw this, saw this problem was that the OpenStack region I was running against had recently been upgraded. This was a few versions back, but it's still an interesting case to discuss. And I did have another region available where the template ran fine, and I had other regions with the new release where it broke. So surely this must be a regression, right? something that somehow slipped past all the gates and, and CI checks. Well, I can tell you when I ran into this, I spent some rather significant time working this one out, but in the end, the alleged encoding problem turned out to be yet another red herring. And here's what it was, just in case you run into something similar in the future yourself. You may recall that in heat templates, we can use a function called string replace or stir replace for string templating. Here's an example for how we can use this. So in this example, the string host in the template parameter is replaced with the IP address of a Nova instance. And that then results in a usable URL that can then be retrieved with OpenStack stack output show login URL in this case, fairly straightforward. And of course, you can use other functions than get atcher to, uh, to construct this value here. But what happens here is the parameter substitution is just a simple string replacement, which means you can name your parameters anything. You're not required to use any variable marker prefix, like say, for example, the dollar character would be in bash. But that quickly makes templates very unreadable. So most people do use some sort of prefix because although there, there is really not much of a convention there because that makes the template slightly more readable. So they would, for example, use something like prefixing a dollar sign. Some people have something like a JSP or ASP.NET background, and they might be using some version of angle brackets and percent characters. Some people just use capitals. This is essentially up to you. The documentation doesn't mandate anything um, as long as it's valid YAML. And of course, that includes things like proper encoding and so on. So I'm going to sh show you a code snippet of one of my heat templates that used to run perfectly fine in all OpenStack releases up to a specific one. And what this does is it simply takes a parameter, a stack parameter named Ubuntu mirror, and then it injects that into an instance's configuration via cloud config resource so that depending on which OpenStack region I launch this stack in, I can select a suitable 
Ubuntu Mirror, right? And like I said, this particular template worked just fine, and then we updated and suddenly it produced an HTTP 500. And now you may say, ha, ah, of course, what's clearly happening here is that he is trying to pass the string curly brace mirror close curly brace as an intrinsic function which doesn't exist. Well, I have two answers for you. <laughs> uh, masking an unknown function name behind Unicode decode error would be pretty silly. And secondly, if you do use proper quoting for the template string, you see exactly the same problem. And in reality, this is all it took. <laughs> so uh, using a different prefix, uh, using the uh, percent prefix here did the trick. And then there was no heat API problem. To this day, by the way, I still have no idea what exactly made this break specifically in that update, but something surely did. So that's my talk on uh, red herrings. I hope you'll find those useful, even if it's just an impetus to look beyond your first impression and then continue troubleshooting uh, with the, the, the non-obvious avenues. These slides for this talk uh, are obviously available under a CC by SA license and uh, I also have some image credits to close out on. With that, I thank you very much for your time.